Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> we have a mic. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Levesque. I'm the executive director here at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. I want to welcome to the NHIOP. <laughs> I know it's a quiet season, and many of you haven't been here recently, so we'll, well, that's, that's the end of my jokes, if you're not going to laugh. <laughs> so uh, this is a place of civility, and this is where we hear the argument, and I think today we're going to hear a great argument. So it's good for our democracy, and the argument is good. But I ask everyone just be to remain uh, civil. And this is about the two people that are up here, actually three people. I'll introduce James Pindle to come up to the stage. He's our moderator today, nationally known journalist. James, everyone knows James. Welcome, James. Okay, you're hot. Well, you can use this one. I'll lend this to you. Okay, until this works. Okay, $20, wow, goodness. Well, thank you everyone for showing up. Um, this is gonna be a unique moment, and I'm glad we're all participating in it, but I do wanna go ahead and just get started. So I wanna introduce uh, Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy and Congressman Ro Khanna from California. Vivek, you're here? I'm nice seeing you. Are you? Let's do a little mic check. Am I? Are you hot? You want to try it a little bit? One two. One two. Okay. One, One two. Okay. Very. Good. You guys hear me? All right. Well, thank you, uh, Neil, and thanks to those in the audience and those watching on C-SPAN. We're here because these two gentlemen wanted to face off and have a lofty and possibly intense uh, discussion about America its role in the world and the future. And I see my role as a facilitator merely to, to, to help them have the debate they want to have. I hope we also step back for a second and just appreciate what we're about to witness because it's so rare in modern American politics these days. This debate will have zero commercial breaks. There aren't <laughs> nine other people on the stage. We aren't asking the participants to solve Middle East peace, give their guardrails for AI, or solve social security in 45 seconds or less. And if I may, uh, uh, we're also going to have the chance to be serious for once and actually flesh out some issues. To honor their commitment to do something different and better, I'm going to make my own similar commitment as a moderator today. Uh, there will be no process questions. No political horse race questions, no hypothetical questions, <laughs> no gotcha questions, and gasp if you will, I will not make a single question or reference to Donald Trump. <laughs> now you may, that's fine, but I won't. I want to quickly go over how this hour will proceed. These gentlemen have identified five topics they want to discuss. They are the following. The economy, foreign affairs, political reform, climate change, and the future of America. We're going to spend roughly 10 minutes on each one of those topics with specific questions for me. At the beginning of each segment, I'm going to ask one question to one person, and they're going to give roughly about a minute answer, because I want to get into the back and the forth. Then the same person, the other person gets the same question. And after that, if there's an issue, take an issue with what uh, Mr. Khan has said, or back and back and forth, please get at it. It's the dialogue that we want. This is the rare platform where we actually get to do that. I will also ask an opening and closing question. During this procedure, the next hour, you may see us looking down at a timekeeper. Caroline's got us on board. She's going to try to keep us on track so we can actually get into as many issues as possible. Uh, so with that, you heard we we're going to try to keep applause to a minimum during this debate. So for once, uh, can we just give a round of applause to Thanks. these two gentlemen for doing this? Very good. Hope we got that out of our system. <laughs> <laughs> All right, opening question. I'm going to go to you, Mr. Congressman Khanna. What is, and you guys wanted to go big, so I'm going to go as big as possible to start this off. Sure. 
what is the most important thing going on right now, either in America or the world, and why? Well, first, James, let me just say why we're here. We're going back and forth on Twitter, uh, exchange some barbs on identity, race, foreign policy. And I thought instead of just trying to score rhetorical points online, why not have a civil, substantive discussion about the future of America with someone you disagree with? And James, I appreciate uh, you're doing this as one of the best political journalists. Uh, it's great to be here at St. Anselm, a model for town hall democracy. Vivek, I just got to be honest about one thing. I want to stop getting confused at airports for you. And I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping this is going to clear that up. <laughs> one thing but, will come out of this. One thing. That's and I, it. I want to also just say how much I appreciate being here. This shows that the online, offline world here. Ro asked me on Twitter, would you do it? Now, is it a different place? I said, I'm spending time in New Hampshire. And I would give credit for him to come here and do this here in New Hampshire, where we're spending our time as well. So well, I appreciate that. And I, look, in seriousness, here's my hope. I mean, you know, someone said, do you want to win this debate? What do you want out of it? Uh, fireside conversation. I said, why can't we do this in living rooms across America, where you can have a civil conversation with someone you disagree with, where you can see where they're coming from, where you can see if there's common ground. In my view, that's the only hope for a polarized nation that's deeply divided to find a way forward. You said, what is the biggest issue facing America? It's our deep polarization. It's our inability to listen to each other. It's our inability to find common ground or move forward. I hope this type of conversation is a model for going forward. Yeah, what is the most, the biggest thing going on right now, either in America or the world? It doesn't have to be bad. It could be a good thing, but what is it? I'll give you uh, but one answer to each. At home, it is our loss of national identity. I think that if you ask people in our generation or younger, what does it mean to be an American, you get a blank stare in response. That is a vacuum of identity. And when you have a black hole that runs that deep, that is when the poison fills the void. And the positive version of that is this is our opportunity. The biggest thing we could do is deliver an answer to the question of what it means to be an American. Revive the ideals of the American Revolution. I think we live in a 1776 moment. That's the big answer domestically. What an exciting time that would have been to be alive in the spring of 1776. I think that's the opportunity we have here right at home now. Now abroad, I would be remiss if I didn't state what I think is the biggest single risk that we face that I don't think leaders in either political party are talking about and should be. I worry that we are on our way to potentially World War III. I am deeply concerned that we are slowly marching our way into a serious conflict that we have become complacent about in this country to believe that that can't happen. It's slowly happening before our own eyes. And I think we need a commander in chief who is expressly committed to keeping us out of World War III to avoid making some of the mistakes we made in the post 9-11 era with Iraq and Afghanistan I worry that though we're having a, you could call it a bipartisan discussion here, I worry that some of the worst ideas in Washington, D.C. are bipartisan. And I think that many of our bipartisan ideas, Republicans and Democrats alike, share responsibility for bringing us to the brink of major conflict. And it's probably my top reason for being in this Republican primary, and I hope it's my top reason for success in leading this country, that I will keep us out of that World War III, but I do look forward to that discussion today as well. Well, that's the opening question. We're definitely going to be hitting on foreign affairs in the next segment. The first segment is on the economy. This question is for you, uh, Vivek. Um, when we talk about, and remember, the initial answer is going to be about one minute, so we can get to some back and forth. When we talk about different ways of measuring the economy, again, broadly, we'll get into this topic, there are a million different ways you can, a million different metrics you can use. The unemployment rate, where the Dow stands, uh, average income, inequality gaps, interest rates, inflation rates, GDP. What is the single most important metric you use to, the, to figure out how the economy is going? Well, I don't know that I would reduce it to one, but I'll make it very simple. Here's what's wrong with the economy. You get a lot of statistics from the White House that would teach you that, or try to teach you, that, oh, we're doing great in terms of the economy and Bidenomics has been a success. Here's why people don't actually experience that in their life. Prices are going up. Interest rates, that includes mortgage rates to buy a new home or otherwise, mortgage rates are going up, and wages have remained flat. 
So that's, what, that's where the struggle actually comes from. What do you do to address it? I think it's not that complicated. Increase the supply of everything that's worth producing in the United States. Increase the supply of energy. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy. That brings energy costs down, it drives economic growth. Bring housing costs down by increasing the supply of housing, land use regulations that we need to get rid of so people can build no more new homes, grows the economy, brings the prices of housing down. Same thing with respect to food, go down that list. And the net result is gonna be economic growth, but the basic obstacle is the administrative state. Those regulations coming from on high have constrained the production of energy, the building of new housing, the production of food, that's driving prices up, it's constraining economic growth, so we know how to do this. We're gonna talk about where some of those obstacles actually come from, the climate agenda or elsewhere, but the clear problem is high prices, high interest rates, stagnant wages, turn that upside down, get the regulatory state out of the way, take the wet blanket off that economy, stop paying people more money to stay at home instead of to go to work, and then the ultimate depressing factor here against the structural issue we face is the $33 trillion national debt, where the interest rates on that national debt are gonna become the single largest line item in the federal budget in just a few years. And in this case, I think we need to bring zero-based budgeting. I don't know where you are on this, but zero-based budgeting to Washington, D.C. Start with, not last year's budget, start with zero as the baseline, and then ask what's actually necessary. CEOs like me, that's the way we've run our businesses. Mm -hmm. The federal government or the states have not been run this way in our national history. That gets us out of our economic malaise, and people tend to be more proud of a country when we're making more money in that country. What's the biggest metric for you? James, it's pretty simple. Is the working class and middle class doing better? They've been shafted for the last 40 years. But first, let's talk about the success of this president. I mean, it's objective success. You've had 13 million jobs created, which is the largest ever in any administration. Now, people say, oh, it's a recovery. 70% of those jobs were recovered. I'm glad they were recovered. Yes, 70% of those jobs were recovered, and they were recovered within two and a half years, and that was because of the American Rescue Plan. But let me just, because we're having this substantive dis disagreement, identify areas where Vivek and I completely disagree uh, with what I call economic patriotism. The role of the government to rebuild industry, to, which has been hollowed out, hollowed out in places like Colebrook, uh, in North Country, hollowed out in Berlin, hollowed out in Manchester. We lost textile mills. We lost factories. We lost steel. Why did that happen? It's because other governments were willing to fight for those jobs with government investment. They were willing to say, we are going to put money in with the private sector and labor to build industry. That's how we built America, with Hamilton, with Lincoln, with FDR. That's what we're doing with the CHIPS Act to bring semiconductors. I know you're passionate about semiconductors. That's how we're getting semiconductors back into Ohio. Now, for the Republicans, and I, 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 some of this you've adopted, they see any problem and they say, let's cut taxes. Let's deregulate. How is that putting a steel plant up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, by cutting taxes and deregulation? It hasn't happened for 40 years. You talk about the deficit. The what? deficit was caused by three things. Three things. It was caused by Reagan's tax cuts, Bush's tax cuts, and Trump's tax cuts, and Bush's overseas wars. That's $15 trillion of that deficit. Take that back, start investing in American industry, and that's what's going to have broader economic growth. That's what I call economic patriotism. You talked about patriotism. I love patriotism, but we're not going to have patriotism if we don't have a vision for economic empowerment, if we don't have a vision where people who don't have health care get health care, where people who don't have child care get child care, where people have a shot at the American dream. Just saying, let's study the founders, let's appeal to rhetoric isn't going to give us a common well, of purpose. Of course it's not. But the common purpose, people, people are going to be more successful in this country when we're making more money. I do think that for somebody, and I think we share this in common, who's opposed to term limits, it is... I think regrettable to be carrying the water of Joe Biden when in fact that everyday Americans know they're suffering at the hands of policies that came from this administration. Energy costs are higher because we have hamstrung our ability to produce oil, to produce oil in this country, to drill, to frack. I know you said you've opposed fracking. I don't think that the constraints on producing natural gas or oil have helped everyday Americans. It's making gas prices go up at the pump. It's constraining our economy. That is what's actually driving inflation. The jobs reports that you cite and the Democrats and Biden have regularly cited do suggest job growth in the labor market. Here's the problem with that. 
the sector with by far the greatest growth in jobs is none other than government. So this is not actually driven by increases in productivity. It's papering over Band-Aid ahead of an election season. And yes, I do agree, we need to stay out of foreign wars. Seven trillion dollars of our 33 trillion dollar national debt are attributable just to Iraq and Afghanistan. That is a disaster, and I for one, because I don't come from partisan politics, have no problem bashing my own party when they're actually responsible for it. And so you're right, that Bush era war, we should learn from that lesson. And yet now, to come full circle, so many of the critics of that Bush war including, respectably, yourself there, come around to supporting the same thing all over again in Iraq 2.0 in Ukraine, in Afghanistan 2.0 in the Middle East, and we're about to make those same mistakes again. And so what it takes is, I think, leaders who think outside of the traditional partisan boxes to say, here's our national debt problem, address it. Here's our economic malaise, address it without those partisan filters. And I think that's going to take a CEO to actually accomplish. As you can tell, my job is to stay out of this um, <laughs> and to let you guys talk. This is what you wanted. We are running over time for the, for the first 10 minutes. I do want to do one more question, though, because sure. uh, you obviously both really disagree on this idea, and I want to get into it. One of your proposals on the campaign, and I want to ask you about this, Roe, is uh, Congressman Khanna. Uh, Row is fine. The vague is fine as well. Uh, is to uh, cut the federal bureaucracy by 75% staffing yes. levels. Why is that a horrible idea? Well, it's a horrible idea because you need the federal government's investments to be able to scale factories. You need it to be able to build. That's how we're building uh, the semiconductor industry. That's how we're building new industries. Now, Vivek said a couple points. First of all, that you want to reverse the tax, uh, the, the deficit, reverse the tax cuts. Reverse the Bush tax cuts, reverse the Trump tax cuts, reverse the Reagan tax cuts. The second point is on economic growth. The economic growth that we're going to get is by investing in our people and investing in our working class. It's not by cutting the Department of Education. You cut the Department of Education here and look at the impact on public schools in New Hampshire, which already don't rely so deeply on funding for the Department of Education. You cut the Department of Education, and what are you going to say, tell the kids who get some funding for public college or apprenticeships that already cost too much? And here's I'll, what tell, I, I'll tell you here, what you tell them, because I think this is, me, this is... And then I'll give you your time. Yeah. I, let me just finish this point, on, <laughs> which I've never understood, because you're, you're a thoughtful guy, obviously, you know, with great education. I've never understood the obsession on fossil fuels, and here's my point. It would be like someone saying, I love the wristwatch, don't give me a, a, a smartwatch. I love the flip phone, don't give me a smartphone. Let's talk about fossil fuels in New Hampshire. New Hampshire pays $70 more on its electricity bill than any other New England state. Do you know why? The reason they pay 70, you guys pay $70 more, is because you get more of your energy from natural gas. And you don't sit on natural gas, you gotta ship it all the way. If you had solar and wind, it actually would be cheaper. It would be saving New Hampshire ratepayers money. So my point is, why not evaluate a technology on its impact? If something is faster and cleaner, use it. No one's saying don't use any fossil fuels. I mean, I drove here. I use fossil fuels. I took. So a we, we can go to the fossil fuels. I just wanted to make sure before we go we do to two later, topics. Yeah, I want to get to I want to get to the administrative state point though, because this is fundamental. The Department of Education. You have a point to decide. Eighty billion dollars of our taxpayer money is going to a federal agency when education is locally administered. So my view is what we need to go in there and do is shut that down and return the $80 billion back to parents and states across this country. So every child and every parent is able to choose where they go to school. Now I favor school choice on steroids. Here's the dirty little secret in American education. You wanna talk about economic empowerment? How about this one? If you're switching from a poorer performing school to a better performing school, 90% of the time, that is to a school that spends less money per student. In New York, $40,000 per student per year in a bad public school, $20,000 or less to a better charter school or public school. I think every kid and every parent should be able to take half the difference with them. Put that in the account of the kid. That kid graduates from high school with a $250,000 graduation gift. It's not even close, which is a better head start on the American dream, rather than feeding the teachers union bureaucracy or feeding the federal employees in Washington, DC. So my vision is the people we elect to run Thank the you. government should run the government, not the bureaucrats. We're going to cut 75% of them. Very short. Uh, very got to get to the other very short, because I'm a product of public education and 90% kids go to public education. There's only one thing I would ask people here to read. 
It's Karabi Jackson. He did a study, and the study was pretty simple. It refuted the Coleman report where he showed that the more you fund public education, the more it increased test scores, the more it increases earnings, the more it increases wages. It's so obvious a point that we want to fund public education. I was surprised someone had to do a study about it. Don't do it through but, the federal but, government. But, but you do okay. it, and you do it in a way that is going to invest in our country. If we want to beat China and we're not investing in education, well, we've got an $800 billion. Okay. Don't do it through the federal government. $800 right. billion, billion. Dollar defense. Let's budget. move on. Thank you for that. See, I, I'm letting you guys get into yeah, this. this is good. good. You've been good. Uh, foreign affairs is next. OK. Um, this question is for Congressman Khanna. Um, some foreign policy doctrines we can put on a bumper sticker. The Monroe Doctrine when it comes to the Western Hemisphere, uh, Obama's pivot to Asia, America first, didn't say his name. Um, George Washington would be his name. Uh, okay. 1796. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, that would be, yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, Congressman, if you were to simplify your vision of American foreign policy on a bumper sticker, what would it be? Well, that's a tough question. Responsible engagement. Responsible engagement. And I'll tell you where. I think Vivek and I differ, because I want to be on this broad picture. I started my political career running against the Iraq war. I got crushed, you know, 19% of the vote, but I was the first anti-Iraq war primary. I opposed the extended stay in Afghanistan. I opposed the strikes in, Lyria, in, 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 uh, uh, in Libya. I am not for forays overseas militarily that don't make sense in our strategic interests. And I led with Bernie Sanders the effort on the war powers to stop the bombing, supporting the Saudi bombing of Yemen. But that doesn't mean isolationism. That doesn't mean that we should not be involved. We need to be involved in the Middle East. We need to be involved in helping bring peace in the Middle East and having the Palestinians and Israelis involved in restarting the peace process. Yeah. We need to be involved in the we'll Pacific. Get into that. Obviously, we're going to get into that. Bumper sticker. American interests. Here's the answer. I have one moral obligation as a father. It is to my two sons and to my family. I have one moral obligation as your next president, and that is to the American citizens here in our homeland, period. And I think we are more likely to stay out of World War III if every nation behaved the same way, because World War III is not in any nation's interest. We sleepwalk our way into world war. Let's study history, World War I. How did killing the Archduke Ferdinand result in major conflict across the world that killed millions upon millions? Vague red lines that nobody knew about. So my view is that we agree on staying out of Iraq or an extended stay in Afghanistan that didn't advance American interests. But what disappoints me is that so many of the Democrats and also Republicans who may have agreed with that, that in the past are now marching us into those same conflicts. Just because Russia is bad does not mean okay. Ukraine is good. 11 opposition parties banned by the government in power. Russian-speaking regions that are occupied. Either you believe in democracy or you don't. In the Middle East, I worry about another prolonged conflict with U.S. presence. This is not what advances the American interests, especially when our top enemy is actually communist China. So to sum up my foreign policy in a nutshell, be what Reagan said about the USSR, I'll say about China. We win, they lose. That's what this comes down to. But every other conflict from Ukraine to the Middle East that we're bogged down in, that dilutes our focus on what actually threatens the American homeland. Avoid World War III, declare independence from China, and then protect the homeland right here at home in the US from border defenses to cyber and super EMP defenses to missile defenses. That's actually what we're missing, and that's where my focus would be. You want American to interest. Yeah, I, I want to, because uh, I saw the, We won't get to other things, but continue. I, I, wanna, I, I saw the Republican debate, and I don't want to be like Nikki Haley and just put you down in some way, because I didn't think that was fair. I want to actually engage you to try to understand, convince you of my point of view. American interest requires American leadership. I believe you're sincere about not wanting China to win. You know, our, I, I ask you, meet with our CIA director. I know you don't love the agencies, but William Burns is respected uh, across the aisle. And he'll tell you that the biggest deterrent for China today to invade Taiwan is what's happening in Ukraine. That's, so you want us to win and prevent China from invading Taiwan? We need to make sure that Ukraine isn't gobbled up by Putin. Now. So you I respectfully say, disagree. Let, let, I, I agree let, with you on Ukraine. Me, I disagree let, with you the way let, we do let, it. Let me flesh this I out, and then on I want you to deterrent. respond, because I, it, it, this is actually a deep dif difference. And I, I want to actually engage, instead of just saying, oh, someone doesn't know foreign policy. Let's engage on the ideas. Here is the, the point on Ukraine. If you allow 
Putin to take some of Ukraine, what, 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 what are we going to do? Should we say to uh, Xi Jinping, take some of Taiwan and that's going to be okay? Of course not. Now, you want to reverse Nixon's strategy. I understand that. But you have to look at the conditions that were there when Nixon did that. The Soviet Union had 39 battalions on China's border. Mao came to Nixon because they were concerned. They had a border war in 1969. I'm well aware of the history. Yeah, so th there was a totally different construct. Right now, you've got Putin saying that Xi Jinping and them meeting 42 times, they're best friends. The idea that, that, that the idea that China is dependent There's on Putin. There's cracks in the armor. The Ch China is dependent on Putin for energy. And the idea that appeasing Putin by giving him Not some appeasing. Ukraine is going to get him out of the China alliance and go to the United States is just not realistic. So, so here's where I think it does take an outsider to bring some sanity to our foreign policy where it's been missing for a very long time. Here's how we're actually paving the way for China to go after Taiwan. Think about this. Put yourself in Xi Jinping's shoes. Right now, Russia and China are in a military alliance with one another. Russia has greater nuclear capabilities and hypersonic They're missiles. They're not in a military alliance. Since 2001, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, there's no there's, formal that's actually, Russian. That's actually, there's no uh, formal let me finish. Russian let me finish. No. And Because this is an issue I happen to know a lot about. They're running joint military exercises across, uh, right off the coast of Alaska. A 2001 treaty of good neighborliness and cooperation. They're treaty bound in a 2001 treaty and a 2022 strategic no limits partnership running joint military exercises today. So now back to the point. Xi Jinping's bet right now is that the U.S. won't want to go to war with two allied nuclear superpowers at the same time. But if we get Russia out of its alliance with China, we have eliminated the single greatest threat to the U.S., that's the Russia-China alliance, and Xi Jinping will have to think twice before he goes after Taiwan. So my view is that we can use the end of the Ukraine war as a chance to do what we should have done long ago, pull Russia apart from China, say that NATO will never admit Ukraine to NATO. That is a commitment that we made back in 1990. James Baker made that to Gorbachev, that NATO would not expand one inch past East Germany. We haven't kept that commitment. Keep and honor that commitment, but require in return that Russia and China split up. There are kinks in their armor, and I can talk about what they are. Russia sending weapons to India, to Vietnam, not allowing China to finish a railroad. Okay. There are kinks in that armor. Now is our moment to pull it apart, but it's not gonna come from somebody in the establishment of either party. It's going to take an outsider to get that deal done, as I will. We, we got to move on a little bit quickly. Sure. I, I want to get I want very quickly because I, I do we, think We've been very quick, but I was <laughs> yeah, trying I, to help I, you out. I mean, it's a different that, vision that of foreign policy. Be, that may for be both your parties. view, but the, and maybe you That's disagree with every expert. But every I don't expert, trust. But, I don't bow every, the knee to the experts. Yeah, I think no, independently about what actually needs to be that done. May be your view. I That's just, what we need in this country. Let me just finish. I just think you should, at some point, get a briefing because you're running, you have a big platform, get a briefing from William Burns, others, they will tell you that standing up to Putin and not appeasing him is actually the biggest deterrent for Xi Jinping. They, they've studied this, and the idea that Xi Jinping, who's saying that there's no more intimate friend than Putin, and Putin, who harbors resentment since the end of the Soviet Union with the United States, the idea that we're somehow going to split his friendship with Xi Jinping and get him to be friends with us without compromising every value America has. And, Ro, with is respect, I just don't think that uh, for when it comes to a U.S. and we're in different seats here, yeah. but when it comes to a U.S. president, I think we need a U.S. president who is purposefully skeptical, listens to the expert class. Listens with an open That's mind, as asking. I do. Listen, but listen. actually to be able Take to, as, as Nixon did it, I, I, we've done, done plenty of that, but actually I have actually actual independent grounded knowledge to cut through the BS that comes out of that pro-war bureaucratic state to say, no, this is how we're actually going to advance American interests rather than the interests of the entrenched D.C. bureaucracy. Okay, as you see today, that's going to take a leader from the time. outside. This is so okay. good. I yeah. love this. this good is, stuff, though. It's great. And I will note we have uh, friends from uh, diplomats from Taiwan in the audience with us coming up from Boston Thank today. Uh, so uh, let's pick a let's
in one part, the brutal attacks on the innocent civilians, Israel has the that you were misquoted, maybe hopefully you'll retract. You want the Hamas leaders uh, on stakes and at the Gaza border. And I guess this is if where- Israel's, If Israel they're, wants they're, to do that, they should be able to do it yeah, for the this leaders. This is where I think we, we have a difference just in terms of leadership. You know, the, you, you said, oh, I'm carrying the water for Biden. I guess I view the world in more nuance. I was Bernie Sanders co-chairs, but I could say what Biden did well, creating jobs and what he d should do better. And we need that nuance on foreign policy. There was a reason when Barack Obama did the single best thing in getting Osama bin Laden. He didn't parade it. He deposed of the remains in the sea because he didn't want to incite more violence against America or the world. And if we were to put Hamas leaders on stakes, we're we not would, doing we it, would all, if Israel were to do it, we should tell them absolutely not, not just because it violates See, the Geneva Convention, because already Christopher Ray saying there are heightened threats to Jewish Americans, Muslim Americans here. Why do we want to inflame the threats? And you have a very important platform, Vivek. I mean, look, you're in the top five presidential candidates. I think you should take that back or at least call for some kind of reason. One point, though, on Israel and where we do disagree on the involvement. I agree with you. We should not be in a ground war. We should not get involved in the war. We need American leadership. We need the leadership that your party, actually, James Baker, started with the Oslo Accords. If America is involved and we can move to a two-state solution, Bill Clinton almost completed it at Camp David. Our big mistake is that we ignored the Palestinian issue. We tried to do the Abraham Accords around the Palestinians. That is not a plausible solution for a just peace. I don't want China leading in the Middle East. I don't want Russia leading in the Middle East. I want our aid to Israel, our aid to Egypt, so that America leads. And I'll tell you something, I don't know if it'll be Joe Biden, but an American president is the best shot with American leadership for peace in the Middle East. See, my goal isn't to lead in the Middle East. My goal is to lead here at home. And I do not think that further deep engagement in the Middle East advances our interests. So Israel is an ally. What does that actually mean? You let an ally defend themselves as they deem fit. So my point was I laid out an array of options that I wouldn't get in Israel's way if they wanted to pursue. But when it comes to the United States of America, our objectives are how do we protect our homeland here? The thing I'm worried about is if that can happen in Israel, and that was a security breach of a large scale we have not seen in 50 years, it was something that Israel missed. If Israel can miss that, that can happen right here at home in the United States of America. So I could care less about leading in the Middle East. I care more about protecting Americans right here at home. And the last point I want to make is on engagement in the Middle East. We actually screwed up. We screwed this one up. And here's something that maybe you'll agree with me on this, but neither party's talking about and both parties need to own up to. Un almost undoubtedly, one of the catalysts, and you won't hear this from the media, Ask yourself why, but they won't tell you I'm wrong about it either. One of the catalysts for what happened was the U.S., led by Biden, but Republican senators along with him, leading discussions about nuclear technology transferred to Saudi Arabia, badly upsetting what is an uncomfortable but at least existent balance of power in the Middle East. The fact that that happened this summer, and then October 7th, you have an attack you haven't seen in 50 years on Israel when it's in the middle of those discussions with Saudi Arabia. We have to confront the reality that every time we stick our nose into the Middle East, it's like somebody waddling into a glass shop. We think we're helping. It's a bull in a china shop. We make things worse, and we leave a mess behind. That's Iraq. That's Afghanistan. And that will not happen again on my watch. And so this responsible engagement, I believe it, you, it comes from a good place. I really do believe that. And I think it is earnest. But that's become the consensus of both parties in Washington, D.C., that I think it's going to take an outsider coming in and calling out the truth for what it is. Our engagement in the Middle East has been horrific in its results. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and expecting a different result. Let's get out, let our true ally defend itself, and then move on to what actually protects the American interest. Greg, right, first of all, there, let's wrap up with this. Yeah, there, and I, I imagine you may have misspoken, but you would agree. There is no excuse. There is no justification. There is no policy of course failure no to explain Hamas's brutal terrorist attack on Israeli civilians. That's why that, I said we should hold them accountable. That has to nothing to do with Joe Biden's policy. It has nothing to that's, do with Republican that's, that's policy. That's not entirely true. That, that, is, that is to do with Hamas's terrorism that needs to be condemned 
So are you in favor of this the Saudi second, nuclear transfer? The, the, and you think the, that's the, entirely unrelated to this? Just for, on the record, I'm you think not, that has no, nothing to do with this? I'm not in favor of the Saudi nuclear transfer, but I don't think that that justifies or excuses. It doesn't justify it. Or of course it doesn't justify it. I'm not sure it's a transfer. Let me, let me just, let but me do just you think finish. these are relevant let, issues let, to discuss? Let, let, let me, yes, the Saudi nuclear yes, transfer, but not the fact that it happened this summer, is something we have to be able to talk about. Not in the context of Hamas. But let me point this out. And this is where I believe you love this country. I do. I believe I think we, you. I think we all do. I, I, I believe here. you've, I you've achieved do. in some way the American dream. But why do you have such an impoverished vision of America that the only thing America is going to do is a provincial sense of its own interest? I don't even think it's our, in our own interest if we disengage. But don't you think America has an obligation to care about human rights? Shouldn't, when we're seeing the bombings of people in Gaza dying, and don't have food and water, shouldn't that be an American obligation? Your Republican speaker is putting a bill with not a single dollar to people in Gaza. You know what makes America great? It's that we believe in the dignity and human rights of people around the world. It's that we're different. It's well, that the thing we, that makes America great care. is that we are that, that example that here at care. home. It's that, yes, we're that example, but you're taking foreign policy blunders. And I agree with you, Vivek, on those blunders. But the answer to those blunders is not to retreat into an isolationism. The answer is not to forget what we did in World War II in liberating the world. The answer is not to forget what we did in the Cold War in standing up for freedom. It's to say, let's learn from the mistakes of not overextending. See, I'm, I'm a George a Washington, America leadership. First conservative, all right? The George Washington vision, is 1796 farewell speech, is the way we set an example for the world is to be that example right here at home. What hope does the free world have if America itself is weak at home as we we are today, a border crisis of historic proportion. You have an illegal immigration crisis that threatens this crisis, this country right here at home. An economy that is struggling that people haven't seen since the Jimmy Carter era, a dependence on China for our modern way of life in a way that we never did on the USSR. So we need to be that shining city on a hill. The way we do it is by being strong at home, setting that example for the rest of the world. And I, Let I our allies I'm... defend themselves. That is what makes America Look, great, and George that is what Watt. makes America itself, and that is what would make George Washington and proud, and that's the standard I use, is whether the founder of this country, if he sees what we're doing today, would he be proud, or would he be appalled? Well, I, I think I, Washington would be appalled, take your point, we'll and we on. need to be, make, make our founding fathers I mean, proud again. That's George what I Washington believe. obviously won the Revolutionary War, but the person, this is why maybe you should sh switch to, to the Democrats, because the person who did <laughs> both was FDR. You know, he, he could walk and chew gum at the same time. That, that was a Democrat, by the way, who led the free world and got us out of the Depression because he didn't believe in gutting the state. He believed in actually having the state work with the private sector to industrialize America, and he believed American values could be held up, up abroad, and he fought for human rights. He was the most successful president of the 20th century, and that, okay. to me, is the model. Okay. So we saw your differences very clearly on the economy and on foreign policy. We're running over time. One area where you, I think, do agree on is political reform. Yes. Congressman Khanna, you have a new bill out, uh, I guess, last month uh, with five cer certain points. Uh, you can go through them quickly. I can read them for him, and we can discuss it either way. I, well, I appreciate it, and I appreciate Vivek's uh, support of this. I think this could be bipartisan. I'm, uh, you know, the, it's pretty simple. Get money out of politics, no PAC money, no lobbyist money, no super PAC. Have members stop stock trading, have term limits, have members of Congress not become lobbyists. You know, I shouldn't be able to be on the Armed Services Committee and then go sit on Raytheon, have some term limits for Supreme Court justices. Now, I, there's a senator here, a great senator, Senator Gene Shaheen, who actually has proposed an amendment, and that's called the Democracy Amendment, that would overturn Citizens United so that you wouldn't have the super PACs that are going and blooding you up. Uh, you know, all the DeSantis super PACs, other super PACs. I'm hoping today maybe you'll support the Shaheen Amendment because that would get rid of the super PACs, uh, and I appreciate your support for some of the political reform. And Josh Hawley just proposed that as well. I, actually, I think this is a great opportunity for true bipartisan reform. Let me just explain to people so these words don't just, you know, land on, on ears. They're designed to sound boring for a reason, but they matter. So the basic way it works in a presidential race is 3300 bucks per person in a primary. That's not enough to corrupt a presidential candidate. But $33 million is. And most of the money being spent in this primary right now, in the Republican primary, is being spent by super PACs, billionaires that the other candidates are licking the boots of every day. Every politician, I think you've seen this enough and I'm sure you'll agree with me, basically every politician dances to the tune of their biggest donor. Now in my case, that biggest donor is me and that's why I'm able to say this. 
we should end the super PACs, apply the same rules that if you're going to advocate for specific candidates, then you're subject to the same $3,300 limit. If you just want to advocate for general issues in American life, we have free speech in this country, you're unlimited in what you can give. That shouldn't be controversial. It's easily fixable. No lobbying for at least 10 years until after you've left. I wish every politician who leaves office the same American dream that I've been able to live. Just do it by actually building your own business rather than using your own government connections as they do today. So the only thing I would say is on term limits. This is one that we can actually get done and that nobody talks about. And I would encourage you to at least elevate, even within the Democratic Party and in Washington, D.C., a discussion about term limits for the bureaucracy. So this is something I can get done as your next president, because as admirable as what Roe and Matt Gates and others, Josh Hawley are proposing in terms of political reform, it isn't going to happen because it requires the very people in Congress who benefit from that corruption to actually pass it. That's what's not going to happen. But here's what I can get done as a president. As the next president, we can implement eight-year term limits as a norm for most positions in the federal bureaucracy, and it makes sense. If I can't work for you for more than eight years as your next president, which I believe is a good thing, then neither should most of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. That's really the true cancer is that the people who we elect to run the government, they're not even the ones really running the government or exercising political power. That keeps the lifeblood in Washington, D.C. fresh. I do think it's going to take a CEO in the White House to actually be able to implement that. But that's, again, something that should go beyond political partisanship and something that would make our founding fathers proud because the administrative state wasn't written into the Constitution. There are three branches of government, not four. And that's the kind of political reform that I do think we can get done with a successful election of the right president in 2024. I would move on to the next topic. Very briefly, you had to add that code. I was hoping I could just agree with you. But you had to, <laughs> well, that'd be too boring. You had, you had to add that, th that thing in. <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, civil don't, service don't, reform don't, 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 is critical. Don't, don't take a look, though, at the Shaheen Amendment, because I, I, if you got behind something like that, that would get rid of the super PACs. Here's the thing on the civil service, though. Too many people in this country are beating up civil servants. I know it's not popular to defend congressional staff or staff at the State Department, staff at the Homeland Security. First of all, we need people there more than eight years to understand what's going on in Ukraine and China. I'll tell you something. I, I have humility. I've been on the Armed Services Committee. I, I've been there seven years. I learned so much, so much for the civil servants. And they're not making the millions and billions of dollars in Silicon Valley that some of my constituents are. They're doing this for, because they love the country. And I just want to- Individually, I, they're I, good people, no doubt wanna, about it. I just want to stand up for them uh, it, because it's, I know it's popular uh, in terms of demonizing them. And, uh, I'm not and, demonizing no, them, bro. No, 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 because no, I think it's really I important. Just, I'm, I'm think, not demonizing anybody because uh, but, then you end up with the false debate. The question is, can a bureaucracy comprised of good people still be wasteful at a scale that leaves Americans holding the bag? And I do not think it's the job of our federal government to provide employment opportunity for millions. You know they should actually fill the open jobs in the private sector, reduce the size of that federal bureaucracy by 75%, and I think everybody's going to be better off. And that's not a slight right, against one, anybody. One line, Vivek, because you, it's you, about you, reviving you, our government. you spent in Silicon Valley, it was one of my favorite leaders in Silicon Valley said, good leaders take people, recruit great people. Great leaders take people and make them great. What we need is presidents who will inspire the, the federal, citizens, not the federal, bureaucrats. federal uh, workforce, and I think they can. We, when we've had great presidents like John F. Kennedy and FDR and Barack Obama, they've seen that talent and they've inspired them, and, I, and they are capable of great things for this. Next country. topic you guys wanted to get into was climate. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Ramaswamy. Uh, there was a recent poll from Yale and George Mason, by the way, that found that Republican views on climate are shifting. And now one out of three Republicans think that climate change should be declared a national emergency. Are they right or wrong? I'm not one of those three Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> I disagree One with out that. of three, but yes. So, so I, I believe facts matter here. Okay, are global surface temperatures going up? Yes, they are. Is that likely owed to some man-made causes? Likely. However, this is not an existential risk for humanity. And to the contrary, eight times as many people are going to die this year of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. In the 1970s, the warning of climate change was an ice age. Look at the cover of Newsweek. Today, they warn the other direction. You want to think about the climate disaster related death rate, the number of people who die from tornadoes, heat waves, and so on, down by 98% over the last century. Why? Owing to fossil fuels. The Earth is more covered by green surface area coverage today than it was a half century or a century ago. 
Why? Because carbon dioxide is plant food. So what we have to do is confront the facts and ask ourselves, are the climate change policies hurting us more than climate change itself? And I think they are. And so my view is that, yes, we should ask what advances human prosperity, human flourishing. Don't ask what minimizes our impact on the climate. Ask what impacts human prosperity, even in the face of a lot of changing circumstances, including the climate itself. And that means using more of all American-made energy, including fossil fuels, such as oil and natural gas. And I will not apologize okay. for that. Are we facing a national emergency? We are. Human flourishing requires a livable planet. That's the, the premise of, uh, of human flourishing. We need a planet. I, originally, when we were going to have this conversation, I was going to come in with all these scientific facts. And then one of the young folks on my team said, Ro, you don't have to convince people in New Hampshire that climate change is real or that it's an existential threat. You all know. You saw the floods in New Hampshire and Vermont. This is not anecdotal, by the way. I've heard you say anecdotal data. The, the American scientific has shown through computer modeling that this is extreme weather events are the cause of uh, increasing temperatures. You know what it'll do to New Hampshire. You know what it'll do to tourism here. You think New Hampshire skiing is going to be around? You know what it'll do to dairy farming and productivity. You know what it'll do to your electricity bills. People in, uh, saw what it did in Maui. I mean, they, we don't have to convince the American people that climate change is a major threat. If you're a data person, read Deloitte's report, $14 trillion. But here's what I don't understand, Vivek. First of all, we have the record oil production right now under President uh, Biden. That's just a fact. So what policies are we talking about that uh, have uh, impacted adversely? We've got record, actually, I'll oil tell you production. About it. Because the IRA hasn't even started to be so implemented. And let me just finish with this one point. I'll, I'll tell you All what policies I'm we're saying talking about. is we can disagree. But maybe we can disagree. You probably want more fossil fuel infrastructure uh, than I do. I want to stop the export of our oil. But can you at least acknowledge this, that we should be open in a $9 trillion energy market to innovation. And if we can come up with new technology that is cleaner and that is uh, better, why not? And why would we want all of that to go to China? Look, I'm open to some forms of nuclear. But you keep saying nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change says it can be about 20%. And most of it right now is not economic. Economical. So what, what, here's, I guess, my question. Why do you have a problem with America also leading in solar, in wind, in, in, in clean forms of energy? Why would I do? And I think, I, think that, I think that there's an opportunity here for innovation. I love innovation. We've innovated innovation within oil production. Natural gas and fracking, horizontal drilling was a great source of American innovation that's been a source of prosperity to Americans and people around the world to whom we export natural gas. But the real opponents to innovation are the ones who are opposed to natural gas, which absolutely I consider a clean form of energy. I've developed five FDA-approved medicines. New I love innovation. Up, so no, I, that's actually not accurate, Ro. I think it's a lot of the mistaken policies. Here's my issue with the climate change agenda. It has nothing to do with the climate, actually. And I could prove that to you. The same people who will howl about reducing carbon emissions, scope three emissions caps in the United States, say nothing as we're literally shifting those same projects to places like China. Chevron is dropping projects that are li literally being bought up by PetroChina on the other side of the world. Last time I checked, it was supposed to be global warming. I'll give you one more fact, because I have read the science on this. So, uh, trained as a molecular biologist back in the day. So I'll tell you this. Even if you subscribe to the core tenets of this movement, methane leakage is 80 times worse for global warming than is a unit of carbon dioxide. Methane leakage is worse in China than it is here. So not only is it net neutral, it's arguably worse even if you subscribe to the tenets of this worldview. And I do think it is hypocritical that many of the opponents of fossil fuels are also the biggest opponents of nuclear energy, which is the greatest form of carbon-free energy production known to man. That comes back to the administrative state. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, since it was created, we have not seen the creation or the construction of a new nuclear power plant in the US. The only country in the world that has a Gen 4 nuclear reactor is actually China. So this is hypocrisy all the way down. And I think that we have to ask the question of what advances American flourishing and what advances American flourishing will advance human flourishing, rather than measuring one Very metric quickly. of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Very quickly, you Please. know, the, the pre Stop. President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act and infrastructure bill actually gives a lot of money to develop nuclear technology. 
and actually helps expedite the permitting. If you read the bill, which is a net that, waste that, that, as long that, as you have the that, Nuclear let me, Regulatory let Commission that stops no, the building. No, it actually is. It, it it calls for reform of the commission. The problem isn't the regulatory. Regulatory. I mean, it's that easy. Is the problem. It's easy to just say, oh, that the is problem the is single problem. Bureaucrats. The problem is the economics. Well, I'll give you just a couple facts here. There's a good facts you'll like. You got to move on. The, the problem is the economics, and I guess my point is their intergovernmental panel of climate change, President Biden, myself, there are a lot of people who believe in climate change who are open to nuclear. And tomorrow if we had fusion, you know, Elon Musk says we have fusion, it's called a sun, why don't we just capture it? If we had fusion, great. We've been chasing that holy grail for 50 years. I'm for Let's develop all of the alternatives. And I don't see why that's... Yeah, I'm not against that. that. I, I'm not against developing so an alternative. That's what the I'm that's what government President Biden's inflation getting in the way. And just is. a fact on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because I think this could be useful in Washington, D.C., if you're able to take this fact back. Three to five years was the time it took to construct a new nuclear power plant before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's how long it takes in places like Japan and France today. After that body was created, it's 25 to 40 years. That is to say, impossible in the United States of America. That's not because you all elected congressmen who voted for that policy. It's because somebody who was never elected decided that we don't want nuclear energy in the United States. And so a lot of this agenda has nothing to do with the climate. It is about flogging ourselves in what has become a modern cult, apologizing for our modern way of life. And as your next president, I will not. And I think that's what it's going to take you know, to actually I, revive this what, country. Here's why. I, I, well, I, I already gave you one, man. Okay. We, we, if we, I could we're running out of time. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. I want to get to the future of America, OK? Um, it was the last topic we wanted to, you guys wanted to address. Um, what do you fantasize America looking like in 2050? By 2050, Texas will be the largest populated state in the country, will be a majority minority uh, country, a multi-ethnic. Um, clearly, obviously, I want to note that we have two Indian Americans uh, on the stage, American Indians, probably a better way of putting it. Um, and let's say with Kamala Harris and obviously Nikki Haley in the race at, at the tops of national politics, Asians are the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States. What, we're obviously deeply polarized, what does the future of America look like? I believe the question goes to you. If you, ha if you had your way. Yeah. I'm very hopeful about the future of America. I'm hopeful when I see the young people. I'm hopeful when I think of my own life story. You know, when I was growing up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, uh, my parents could not have met a staff member to a member of Congress. Today, there are five South Asians in the United States Congress. This is a country of progress. But you know what I think we need over the next 10, 20 years? We need an American production renaissance. If we revitalize our economy in this country, if we bring back the new steel that's also going to have lower carbon footprint, if we bring back the modern aluminum production, if we bring new technology jobs to historically black colleges, historic institutes, if we bring economic opportunity to every community so they can build wealth and people can live in places they love, that can make us a preeminent economic leader in which everyone has a stake. And I want for every American the chance this country gave a vacant eye. That's it. You know, I came, my parents weren't uh, poor, they were, they were middle class. My dad was an engineer, my mom was a substitute school teacher. But I could go to a dentist, I could get health care, I could go to a good public school. I had to take out too many loans, I got lucky, I went to Silicon Valley and, you know, did, did well, have a, a good wife whose father did well. But we, I had the basics. Why can't we do that in this country? Why can't we have childcare at $10 a day, Medicare for all, free public college? And you, they say, how are you gonna pay for it? Reverse Reagan, Trump, Bush tax cuts. Put that money in giving working and middle class families a shot at the American dream. That's how we bring this country together. So I, I think that I'm glad to hear that we also may share at least a longer run bright future for America, even if we disagree about the paths that get us there. We're taught to believe in both parties right now that we're this nation in decline, right? That we're at the end of the ancient Roman Empire and all we have left is to fight over the scraps of a shrinking pie. I don't think we have to be ancient Rome. The way I see this as a nation, and I say this as a young person, as a nation, I think we're really just a little young right now. Actually, going through our version of adolescence. We're going through hard times. I'm not going to come here and tell you it's morning in America. It's not. But it can be again. I think we can still be a nation in our ascent. And the way we're going to get there is by reviving this thing we call merit in the United States of America. What is merit? 
Each of us has God-given gifts. They're not the same. Each of us on this stage, in the audience, each of us has different God-given gifts. But America's the country on earth that allows you to achieve the maximum of your God-given potential without anybody standing in your way. So what's my dream for 2050? That we'll tell our kids and our grandkids that the United States of America is still the nation where no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what your skin color is or how long your last name is in some of our cases, that you still get ahead in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you are free to speak your mind at every step of the way. And yes, that is the American dream. And it is not alive and well, it's alive and on life support right now, but it will be alive and well in 2050 again. I think it can be a lot sooner than that if we all step up and do our part. And so I want to thank you for, for also engaging in that discussion. I really enjoyed thank it. You. And, and thank we you. We want one more quote? Thank you. We have one more question, and yeah. make, we'll make it short. Uh, this has been awesome. This has been really great. I think the audience agrees. It's been awesome. Um, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. One last few seconds closing statement. What do you want to uh, polarize America to take away from this past hour? So it's interesting. <laughs> I think we have celebrated our diversity and our differences for so long that we actually forgot all of the ways that we're really the same as Americans, bound by a common set of ideals, right? We, we both have the same shade of melanin up here on this stage. So what is actually my answer to that question, unless our diversity can be a beautiful thing, but it only matters if there's something greater that unites us across that diversity. Without that, we're just a bunch of two-legged higher mammals walking some geographic space that we call a country, doing what our iPhones told us to do on a given day. That's not America. America is a vision of what that place can be. E pluribus unum means from many, one. And I believe those ideals still exist. Even though I disagree with my friend here on a lot of things, I believe that in his heart, and the people who he represents, and the people who voted for him even, share those basic ideals in common. We might disagree on corporate tax rates or whatever. Those are details. But we agree on the basic rules of the road, meritocracy, free speech, the pursuit of excellence, self-governance over aristocracy. I think most of us in this country do. I'm calling the bluff on the artificial myth of national division. It, those of you in the audience are not nearly as divided as the media in the back of this room would teach you to believe that you are. We still share the ideals of the American Revolution in common. But now it's up to us to move just beyond celebrating diversity and differences to celebrate those ideals that unite us. That is why I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm optimistic that we will succeed. So thank you. Yes. I appreciate that. I, I love the media. Never, Machiavelli never criticized those who have the pen. But, uh, <laughs> but, but let, let, me, uh, let, let me thank uh, you, Vivek, because you've lived up to your terms of keeping this as a civil uh, conversation. I think we need to do more. And it was a risk for you to do this running, and I appreciate your engaging. And James, thank you. I, I guess where I would uh, say is that I don't think it's history started with you or me, Vivek. And I have the same aspiration, but I also recognize the struggles of race and the struggles of people who have fought for that more perfect union. If we were going to teach history properly in America, uh, and I, one reason we should, and some of you have heard me say this, I would lead with a f speech by Frederick Douglass called Composite Nation. In 1869, Frederick Douglass, after 20 years of being enslaved, 20 years of being enslaved, chooses not to speak out for black Americans. He chooses to speak out for Chinese Americans in 1869. And he says, I believe in the free era of America. People can come from all different backgrounds, all different faiths, all different cultures, and we will become a composite nation. Since then, we've had the internment of Japanese Americans. We've had the civil rights movement. We've had Bhagat Singh thing, where people like Vivek and I weren't even allowed to be citizens. We've had the, my, our parents not being able to come here. We've had profiling of Arab Americans after 2011, 9-11. Uh, but we've continued to make progress. And here's what I say to young people. We have come too far to turn back. We have come too far to turn back when I look at the young people in Congress, Delia Ramirez, Maxwell Frost, Jasmine Crockett, it gives me hope.
when I looked at this young generation, it gives me hope. Our work is hard, but our work is to vindicate Douglas's vision of becoming a cohesive multiracial democracy. And the more conversations like this that we have, the better shot we have of doing that. Well, gentlemen, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's good to see you. Great discussion. Thank you.